Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Hope Church Online. My name is Josh, and I'm a volunteer and also one of the elders here at Hope Church. And with me in the studio this morning is Katie. Good morning, Josh, and good morning to all of you online. And I'll be honest, this morning, something that I love about the online experience that Hope Church is hearing where everyone is watching from. So if you have the chat pulled up this morning, let us know what town you're in. Yeah, we got it right here in front of us, and we'd love to hear from you. Katie, why do you love that so much? I just love how connected we are no matter where we are. We're yeah. not just in the building in Oconomowoc, Wisconsin. We're hanging out with you at your home, your coffee shop, or even on a Wednesday morning because someone who watches has a schedule that doesn't allow them to join us for the live stream. So, hey, if you're watching this after we're live, uh, still drop your location in the comments. It is just so cool to see how connected we are all over. Yeah, for sure. I, we would love to just know where you're from and, and love, love to hear from you today. Um, in the chat, we've got James hanging out with us today um, and also one of our regular chat hosts, Jess. Good morning to both of them. They're here to answer any questions that you might have, and they're going to be putting links in throughout the service for a next step that you might be interested in taking. Um, and Katie, I think Jess actually has a poll that she's going to put in there about Wisconsin summer, so I'll ask you, are you more likely to go on a hike or go to the lake in the summer? Well, since we're in lake country, Home field advantage. the lake is going to dominate, right? I would assume so, but there is only one way to find, one way to find out. Yeah, so while you're dropping all your responses to the poll, uh, tell us where you're watching from. Why don't you also tell us what's coming up next? Yeah, well, when Katie and I are here done here this morning, um, the tech team's going to take you behind uh, me into the auditorium, and that's where our band's going to kick things off with a few songs. Um, and then, Katie, I'm super excited because we're going to get a chance to relive Easter in Lake Country from uh, two weeks ago. And I hope you were here to join us for it. It was an awesome event. Um, and then uh, we're all ready for episode two of our series, First and Second Americans. And wow, last week was good. Yeah. If you were not with us last week, the only thing you need to know is that this series is about what if God wrote a letter to the American church today? What would that letter say? And Josh, what would you say was your biggest takeaway from that first week? Yeah, I think there was a lot of things that stood out to me last week. Um, and, and it starts with the word fear. Um, Jason talked a ton about fear and how the media has monetized fear um, and uses that as a way to, um, to drive interest, to drive clicks and things like that. Um, and it hadn't really occurred to me that that's, that's on purpose, right? There's a reason that everything is so bad in the news and things like that. But the more important thing was I loved how he spun it back to like, hey, God's in control. Um, God's got a plan, and if there's anything that we really need to fear, it should be it should be to fear God, because um, God is the one that when we show Him the proper love and respect, that posture is a super healthy way to go through fear. I think. So, um, if you want to watch, you can find all the ways on the QR code if you scan that on your screen. Uh, there's going to be links in the chat. You can ask for that. But something we have to mention is this series is eight weeks long. It's a long one. And uh, starting this week, we actually have short-term group options in person starting on Tuesday and then online starting on Wednesday. Yeah, and if you've never been in a group before, please make this the time that you decide to check it out because um, it's the best way to expand on what we're talking about here on Sunday mornings. It gives you a chance to build community um, and also like just talk about how you're feeling and thinking and know that you're not alone. You know, Katie, I, I've led groups, I've been in groups, and I, I just can't get enough of it because it's such a healthy thing for me. Right, and this group is for everyone. So even if this is your first Sunday with us, at the end of the message, you're thinking, yeah, I want to talk this out with someone. Go ahead and write to me. And I also want to write to me. So it's pretty easy, like, whatever. Yeah, I love that it's in such an easy entry point. And, and if you are new to the channel, we also want to give you a special welcome today. We are so glad that you're here. And if at any point today you just find yourself enjoying the music or really want to get more into this series or some of the things here at Hope, the first step that I would encourage you to take is hit the subscribe button right there on your screen. You know, and I'm not going to try to like sound like a cheesy YouTuber here, but honestly, subscribing us will just tell you next Sunday when we're going to go live so you don't miss out. And again, if you're ready to connect, meaning you want someone from our staff to personally connect with you, there's a ton of ways to get to our connect card. So scan that QR code. You can text the word new to the number that's on your screen and check out the links below. You can also type the word new into the chat. You know, honestly, let, let's look what's happening in the chat right now. Let's see who's here joining us here this morning. Yep, we've got Doug and James. Hi, Jess. And uh, remember to do the poll. Of yeah, what are we voting you, for? If you're at the lake or out hiking, what's your summer fave? Yeah, good morning to um, Tent Maker Biz. Um, 
love to see you in there here in the chat this morning. Um, you know, we are... Um why don't we all stand to our feet? And if you're in the room, why don't you scoot in a little bit? We still got people coming in. Let's get ready and sing this morning. Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come all you sinners, come find his mercy, come to the table, he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. See, that's what it's all about. We're here to celebrate Jesus and that he died and rose for us. So let's continue to sing together. Bring all your failures. Bring your addictions. Don't lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting there with open arms. Sing this out for God so loved. For God so loved. hell's defeated. We can rest in the love of God. We're going to sing about who Jesus is and what it is that he's done for us. So let's keep singing. Death has died, crushed by nail-pierced hands. When you said it's finished, life began. Overcome by grace, mercies now. Oh, the gates of hell did not prevail. Jesus, the King of the kingdom. Jesus, the author of freedom. Death has lost its way to a i 
celebrate that. Guys, Easter was a couple of weeks ago, but we are still celebrating all that went on here at Eastern Lake Country. So as you take a seat, why don't you take a look at this little recap? Hey, here with me, I've got Alexis. She's our kids' director. Alexis, we had a lot to celebrate this Easter, didn't we? We sure did, Michael. At Hope Kids, we're still celebrating the fact that we had 326 kids join us for Easter in Lake Country. I know, right? It was our biggest weekend attendance yet at Hope Kids. But it's not just about the number, Michael. It's about having the opportunity to share Jesus with kids fourth grade and under while adults got to enjoy Easter right here in the auditorium. Yeah, that's fantastic. But I mean, you got 320, that's a small elementary school. Like, that's crazy. Do you have any other crazy Easter numbers that happened that weekend? I sure do. We okay. went through 900 Easter eggs. Oh, my gosh. And 1,500 crumble cookies. Oh, wow. Does anybody like crumble cookie? Hope loves yes. crumble. <laughs> yes, we do. This is not a sponsored post, by the way. We just, we really do enjoy If you have any cookie. connections, let us know. How many Polaroids did you take, Michael? Yeah, I had my little photo booth. I took probably 260 photos, Polaroids through the weekend of family and friends that were coming through. I just want to say thanks to you guys, too. That was really cool to see all of the guests that came to Hope for the first time that Easter. You know, maybe all the people that were watching online that made that weekend their first weekend here at Hope. And so thank you guys for inviting your friends and families so that those guests could experience Easter in Lake Country. Absolutely. And a weekend like Easter in Lake Country would not be possible without our volunteers. So thank you again to everyone who served. 
It takes hundreds of people to make such a big and important weekend happen. And we want to thank you guys as well for all of your financial generosity. We can't do weekends like Easter in Lake Country without you. And so if you want to begin supporting Hope Church financially, it's easy. If you're online, you can just click the link in the chat. If you're here in the room, you can scan the QR code that's on the seat back in front of you. Or there's some drop boxes in the back of the room where you can leave things as you go. It was so fun to celebrate Easter with you all, but we're going to continue to celebrate Jesus here today. So why don't we all stand as we sing another song together this morning. Let your word in me be 
Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Hope Church, everyone in the room, everyone online. We're so glad you're here today. Uh, My name is Jason. I'm the lead pastor on staff here at Hope Church. And today we're in part two of our series, First and Second Americans. Now, in case you missed last week, uh, the idea for this series is that if you open up the New Testament and you read it, what you'll find is that about Half of the New Testament is a collection of letters, a collection of letters written by first century apostles to churches scattered throughout the Roman Empire in various cities. And their purpose was um, the fact that the New Testament wasn't written yet uh, meant there were some gaps in people's theological understanding about understanding the teachings of Jesus. So apostles would spend time in different cities and then they'd write these churches letters to say, hey, I noticed there's still this gap. I'm hearing about this gap, this lack of understanding in your context around the teachings of Jesus and how to follow Him. So they would write these letters. They would say, hey, in your specific cultural context, in your city, you have some unique cultural blind spots about organizing your life around Jesus. And so let me fill in some of those and show you some of those blind spots. They were just to be helpful. And they were written to churches in cities like Ephesus or Corinth. So we have books of the Bible called Ephesus and 1 and 2 Corinthians. And our thought was, well, what if we got a letter? What what if a first century apostle inspired by God could somehow look into the future and see the church in America in the 21st century? What would he write to us? What would he write to us about our theological deficiencies about understanding the teachings of Jesus? What would he write to us about our cultural blind spots about organizing our lives around following Jesus? Now, our answer to that question is this series, First and Second Americans. What if we got a letter about following Jesus today? Last week, I got the series kicked off by talking about fear. I believe that an apostle would begin by talking to us about fear because although the fact that our lives in America are better in every measurable category than any generation of American who's come before us, fear and anxiety are rampant in America today. And part of that has to do with the fact that I believe the American church has lost a sense of what it means to fear God. Fear is a topic that occurs hundreds of times in the Bible. Uh, The biblical authors make it clear that if you don't learn what it means to fear the Lord and to retrain your thinking around fearing God, you're not going to flourish with the rest of your life. The book of Proverbs say that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's the beginning of knowledge. It's a secure life you have if you know what it means to fear the Lord. So we looked at John the apostle and what he wrote, and John told us about how he met Jesus, not as a humble rabbi anymore, but as the glorified, exalted Son of God, the guy who had blazing fire for eyes, and to stand before him was like standing in front of the hottest furnace, and he had a sword, and he rode a white horse, and his robe was dipped in blood, his own blood, because he gave his life for the sins of the world. And when John saw the glorified Jesus, he trembled and fell down in terror, because in the presence of the glory of God, the one who is Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, John realized how small and insignificant he was. He feared the Lord. But this Jesus, who was all glorious, touched him and said, don't be afraid because I was dead and now I'm alive forever and ever. I gave my life for your sins, but now I am exalted forever and ever. So you don't need to be afraid of anything. And in this, we learned our three anchor points that we're going to come back to again and again for the rest of the series. What we learned last week was that Jesus is God's son. Okay. Yes, we, we read his biographies where he was the, the humble rabbi of Nazareth, but make no mistake, he is also the glorified son of God. Jesus is king, king of kings, and Lord of lords, and in the end, he reigns over heaven and earth, and Jesus has the words of life. We submit to his words, not my feelings, not my desires, not my wishes, the words and teachings and way of Jesus. And so, I believe a first century apostle would tell us to fear and love God. Fear God because compared to Him, we are very flawed and sinful and insignificant, but love Him because this is the God who loved, who used His power to love you with an undying love. Now, if any of the ideas we talk about in this series, because we're going to talk about politics in this series, okay? It's an election year. It's going to be, like it or not, seven more months of contentious politicking is going to be going on. It's going to be very hard to escape, but if you want to start a commune out of town, I'm, I'm 
I would look into that with you, okay? I'm just, it's never been my jam, but this year I might. Um, but as we talk about politics, we're going to anchor it to th this idea. Let's go back one. Jesus is God's son. Jesus is king. Jesus has the words of eternal life, okay? We're going to talk about culture wars in this series. In, in fact, in part five, I'm going to explain why culture wars are both useless and futile to engage in. But as we talk about culture wars, we're going to anchor that to the fact that Jesus is God's son, Jesus is king, and Jesus has the words of eternal life. We're going to talk about consumerism. We're going to talk about liberty and the pursuit of happiness. We're going to talk about our native land. We're going to talk about all these very American topics, but we're going to anchor everything we do to these truths. Jesus is God's son. Jesus is king. Jesus has the words of eternal life, and so we fear and love God. Now, if you want to go deeper with any of these in conversation with us, today is your last day to sign up for a short-term group. Uh, we have short-term groups that they end as soon as the series ends. It's just a chance to come together in community and talk about some of these ideas that we're talking about on Sunday mornings. Uh, if you're in the room, you can still sign up today in the hub. Uh, that's the room on your left as you leave the building, or you can scan the QR code on the seat back in front of you. Uh, if you're watching online today, you can check the link in the chat, talk to our chat host, and find out how you can get signed up, but today is the last day to register for that. Today, we are talking about our next topic with first and second Americans, and I want to talk about why it is that our country feels more divided than it has ever felt before. Now, to be clear, our country is not more divided than it's ever been. Uh, we literally had a civil war in the 19th century. And in part six of the series, I'm going to show you statistically that our country is more united than some people want you to believe it is. That said, there are very real divisions that exist in our country today. And we can trace the roots of those divisions all the way back to the Declaration of Independence. Uh, here's the famous opening to the Declaration of Independence. Our founders wrote, we hold these truths to be what? Self-evident. I'm going to come back to that idea. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, Liberty, the pursuit of happiness, and the right to randomly capitalize letters. I think they had different capitalization rules back then than we do today. No, there's, there's another right. Here's the important one. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Government derives its power from the consent of the governed. And, and with this, we declared our independence. Now, what's fascinating to me is that the founders used the word self-evident to talk about these truths, that you have the right to life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, and the consent to be governed. Because if a truth is self-evident, do you need to say that it's self-evident? No, it's so self-evident, you don't need to say, oh, this is self-evident, by the way. And it was clearly not self-evident because before the founding of America, these rights were not practiced in any form of government anywhere in the history of the world. Furthermore, this self-evident collection of truths apparently wasn't even self-evident to our founders. Because for 90 years after this document was signed, slavery was still legal in the United States. For 145 years after this document was signed, women were denied the right to vote. So the people who found these truths self-evident struggled to implement and practice what was self-evident to them. So if it clearly wasn't self-evident and if they didn't apply it, why did they call this collection of truths around individual rights to be self-evident? The answer had everything to do with their cultural moment. Let me explain with an illustration. Sociologists will tell us that as human beings, if we're going to thrive and flourish in our humanity, we need to figure out how to strike a balance between two opposing values, living in community, yet maintaining autonomy. As human beings, we're made for community. We need relationship. We need affirmation. We need love. We need to feel belonging. 
At the same time, we're individuals. You were made in God's image. You are God's workmanship. You need to be free to think your own thoughts and to make your own self-determining decisions. And we need to strike a balance between these two juxtaposed values. Well, in the ancient world, long before America came along, societies leaned heavy into community instead of autonomy. They had to. The ancient world was a very dangerous place. If you didn't have your family, if you didn't have your tribe, you might not survive. So it made sense in an ancient world that people leaned heavily into community. But in the Western world, all that began to shift in the 16th century with the Protestant Reformation. Before the Protestant Reformation, there was one Christian church in Europe. It was the Roman Catholic Church. And the Roman Catholic Church taught that the only way you can be saved is to be a member of good standing of the church. You had to belong to this community or you could not be saved. The Protestant reformers came along and said, no, 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 no. They reintroduced the biblical idea that you're not saved by belonging to a community. You're saved because you as an individual have faith. You are saved because you have faith. It's by faith alone, not by belonging to a certain community. Well, in the aftermath of the Reformation, violent and bloody wars erupted throughout Europe. And the reason why was because people still believed that if a nation, a community was going to hold together, it needed a common faith practice. A common religion was the glue they believed that would hold society together. So there were wars waged within countries and against other countries about what would be the official state-run church in order to hold communities together. Well, when people saw all the bloodshed that was happening over this, thinkers like John Locke began to emerge and said, what if there was another way to have community where we didn't all have to belong to the same church? What if there was a way to govern where the church wasn't involved and people could be free to choose whatever church they wanted to be part of? And so John Locke thought, what if we had government systems that were built on the consent of the people rather than subjects who have to do the will of the king because of when and where they were born? What if we had citizens who had certain rights as individuals? Well, this is what we call political individualism. Political individualism says individuals do have rights and they do have the consent to be governed, but they want to be mindful that we also need the community to thrive and flourish and do well in life. Now, this was the cultural moment into which our founders were born. They saw what happened when there was heavy community and light autonomy, they saw the devastation that it wreaked on humanity and how it it totally eroded people's freedoms. So in their cultural moment, they said, what we need is a government that is by the people, of the people, and for the people. Not for the individual, not by the individual, by the people of the people, for the people. So it was a government that ensured individual rights, yet promoted the stability of society, the community. And this was basically how America operated all the way up until the Second World War. People had political rights. Everybody gets to vote. Everyone's view is important. Everyone should have equality. Yet, there was also an understanding that we need the community. And certain rights, certain freedoms need to be restrained for the benefit of the well-being. I have rights, but I have a family to look after. I have rights, but my neighborhood is important. I have rights, but my church is important. My country is important. You see, people in an age of political individualism thought deeply when the question was posed, or the statement was posed, ask not what you can do, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And this balance is the reason why we call the greatest generation the greatest generation. As individuals, they felt a deep responsibility 
to uphold the rights, not just of the American community, but the communities of the world, to make sure that all the communities had autonomy. It was a balance built on responsibility and obligation. Well, after World War II, this balance began to shift. And there were a few cultural forces that drove it. The first one was materialism. You see, after the war, all these GIs and soldiers came home and they needed jobs. And all these factories that had been part of the war effort needed to be repurposed, and so we used them to make clothes irons and washing machines and televisions and automobiles. And at the same time, our nation built more infrastructure like bridges and interstate highways. As a result, people who used to sit on their front porch and talk to their neighbors could now just watch TV in their living rooms. And people who used to sit outside in the yard and do laundry and talk now could do all their laundry in their own home. And people who used to stay in their own community for vacation now could hop in their car and travel on the interstate and be free and autonomous. It used to take a village and an extended family and a neighborhood to raise children. Now, you can just do that with the nuclear family. And it's no surprise that materialism eventually gave way to consumerism. Consumerism is a mindset that says, everything is here for me. I gave you money, so now you owe me things. I, I paid my taxes, now my government owes me some things, right? Or the corporation owes me some things. It used to be in the greatest generation that if you had a job, you would likely have your entire career with one corporation. But today, it's only as long as it benefits me that I'll stay with this company. The other thing that really pushed things towards the autonomy end of the scale was the sexual revolution. You see, before the 1960s, and especially before World War II, sex was simply a natural appetite. After the sexual revolution, sex became part of your identity, part of who you were as an individual. In fact, think about how fundamental this shift was. Before World War II, the purpose of making money and the purpose of having sex was all about community. You made money to provide for your family, to pay your taxes, to be a good citizen, to help the economy. After World War II, you made money to build a sense of identity. Before World War II, sex was about creating family, having and raising children, fostering intimacy with your spouse. After the sexual revolution, sex became about your identity. So these forces kept shifting us more and more towards not political individualism, but expressive individualism. The modern idea of American freedom, which is a far cry from what the founders ever envisioned. Because the modern ideal of expressive individualism is that I am free to do whatever I want to do, and no one has the right to tell me other. Now, there's a progressive version of this and a conservative version of this. The progressive version of this has to do with sexuality and gender. You are free to choose to be whatever you want to be, sexually or gender, and no one can tell you different, and you have to accept that. The conservative version of that says, you better not tell me what I need to believe. I'll decide for myself what I'm going to believe. But both grow out of autonomy. Okay, here's another example. Progressives say we need to cancel student loans because we need to help these individuals be more autonomous to live their lives. Conservatives say, I want to respect their autonomous decision that when they freely took out that loan and they can repay it. Now, now, just to be clear, I know that I totally mischaracterized your side, but I got the other side right. I know. So don't send the email. I already know I did that. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just making a point. The point I'm making is... Both modern conservatism and progressivism are growing out of this paradigm. The modern American no longer feels a sense of duty to the community, but our idea of freedom, our definition of freedom has shifted and has become all about being an autonomous self, an autonomous individual. And when you build a society that is a bunch of autonomized individuals, a bunch of sovereign nations of one, not only will you have a divided society, but you will have a recipe for anxiety. 
because everyone is determining for themselves what's right and wrong. Everyone is determining for themselves the meaning of life with no sense of community to prop us up and support us. So, how do we restore this balance? Because we can see the damage that living this way is causing America. But let me tell you what the answer is not. The answer is not to go back to 1950. The answer is not to engage in culture wars so that we can go live like it's the 1950s again, because culture wars are not the answer. And we're going to talk about that later in the series. Instead, we need to understand the spiritual dynamic that's in play. Because there is a spiritual element driving all of this. And if we can understand that, just as the church in America, I believe it can start a revolution that actually leads to a healthy, flourishing society. And the apostle that I believe was perfectly equipped to tell us about all of this was Peter. Today, I'm going to read you something from the book of 2 Peter in the New Testament. 2 Peter was Peter's farewell letter. Uh, he had been arrested, and he knew he was about to be executed by Emperor Nero. So there's some final things he wants to share with the church before he departs. Now, here's the context. Around 30 years after Easter Sunday, some false teachers had infiltrated the church, and what they were trying to do was marry biblical ideals with cultural ideals, specifically Epicurean ideals of eat, drink, and be merry, live for yourself, follow your feelings, follow your desires. If it feels good, it must be good. To make those two ideas come together, they were trying to dismiss everything we talked about last week. There's no final judgment. Jesus doesn't care about your morality. Dismiss those aspects of His teaching that tell us how to live a flourishing, healthy life, and just believe in Him to get your sins forgiven. And then do whatever you want. If it feels good, it must be right for you. So Peter is going to address these false teachers in this final letter that he writes. And in this, we learn how to rebalance as individuals, as a church, and start a movement in our society of how to strike the proper balance between the autonomy of the individual made in the image of God and the community in which we live. So we're in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 18, where he wrote this. For they, and he's talking about these false teachers who are saying, yeah, j just get your sins forgiven by Jesus and go live however you want. It, it dismiss everything he says about uh, living a godly life. For they mouth empty, boastful words by appealing to the lustful desires of the flesh. They entice people who are just escaping from those who live in error. So he says there's these brand new Christians. They're putting their faith in Jesus. They're getting baptized. But then there's these false teachers who are saying, but go live for you. Live, live however you want to live. Do whatever feels good to you. You live your autonomous life. Now, he says what they're appealing to is the flesh. Now, now, the flesh is a technical word in the New Testament. So, so I want to uh, cut away quick to uh, the book of Romans where, where Paul describes the mindset of the flesh very well. He says, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the Creator who is forever praised. You see, the, the flesh is the operating system of your life. And either your operating system will be centered on God and He will be the center and everything will operate around God, or... The operating system of your life will be something that God made, and you'll order your life around something God made. Could be your health, could be money, could be success, could be a person, could be fame, doesn't matter, anything that God made. But instead of ordering your life with God at the center, you order your life with something you desire in the flesh at the center, okay? Th that's the difference between the two. Either God will be the center or something else. So, when we talk about the flesh, here's what this means. The flesh is our default operating system. It is motivated by disordered desires. It wants to turn good things into God things, okay? Money's good until you turn it into a God thing. Your health is good until you turn it into your God, okay? Another person that you love is good until you turn that person into your God. Your career is good until you turn it into your God, because the second you do that, you've placed at the center of your life something that is vulnerable and weak and be can be taken 
away. Pleasure is good. God invented pleasure. He made your body. He made it to experience pleasure. Pleasure is good unless it becomes your God. And that's what these false teachers were recommending. Follow the lustful desires of your flesh. We didn't come up with that in America. That's part of human nature. So, Peter wrote this. They promised, these false teachers, they promised them freedom. Hey, do whatever you want. Don't let anybody tell you how to live your life. While they themselves are slaves of depravity. Four, people are slaves to whatever has mastered them. People are slaves to whatever has mastered them. Look around our society. The society of people who love freedom. Freedom is our number one value in America. Look around the society that was built on the right to life and liberty. And what you will find are a people who are enslaved to what has mastered them. Our attention spans are shorter than any generation of Americans that have come before us. Why is that? Because the devices that give us freedom, we have become enslaved to. And we're losing our ability to focus, to pay attention on anything. Deaths from overdoses are at record numbers in America. Why is that? Because it's a fine line between freedom, I'm going to do what I want to do, and addiction. It's a fine line between freedom and slavery, and you don't always recognize it until you cross it. We live in a country that has never been more anxious, more obese, more alcohol and drug dependent than ever before. Why? Because... When we don't have restraints on our desires and appetites, it leads to slavery. We don't gain freedom by doing whatever we want. We lose freedom by doing whatever we want. If you say, I'm going to have no restraints on my money, I'm going to do whatever I want with it, you're going to be enslaved to Visa, to MasterCard. You're not going to have any freedom financially if you live without restraints. See, when America was founded, we understood that. To really embrace freedom, there have to be certain restraints. Spiritually, this is the same principle. Peter knew that these false teachers were leading people into depravity, into slavery, while they promised freedom the entire time. But real freedom requires the right restraints. Okay? You can't imbibe according to every impulse and desire you have and be free. You can't scroll on your phone as much as you desire and end up free. Okay? You can't eat donuts as much as you desire and be free. <sighs> that one's hard for me. Real freedom requires the right restraints. That's what Peter's teaching us here. So, for the balance of our time, I want to quickly show you that there are certain restraints to embrace if you're part of the church. And I know at Hope Church, not everyone's part of the church. Um, that, that's cool. You get to kind of peek in and, and you can kind of judge us for not doing what we should have been doing all along. And we're also going to see how we interact in society to be a people who restore a proper balance between autonomy and community. So, here's what this looks like inside the church. I want to start in John 17. In John 17, uh, this is the night Jesus was betrayed by Judas Iscariot. And John takes an entire chapter to record a prayer that Jesus prayed to his father. Now, I think this is one of the most fascinating, powerful chapters of the Bible personally because we get to listen in on one half of a conversation that takes place within the Trinity. Um, but, But here's what Jesus prays right before he is betrayed and crucified for the sin of the world. He said, my prayer is not for them alone, his disciples. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. This would include us today, by the way that all of them, including us today, may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. 
Okay, Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit, the triune God, are three distinct persons who live in a perfect community of one. Jesus says, Father, I am in you, you and in me. We are God in this unique dynamic. And what I want is that just as I am in you and you are in me, I ask that they would be brought to unity as the church. Look at how he continues his prayer. He says, I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete what? Unity. I want my church, I want my believers to be in relationship, in community with one another in a way that reflects how you and I are in community, Father. He wraps it up. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them, even as you have loved me. See, Father, I want my church to be so unified that when the world looks at them, what they see is a community of people who respect and honor the individual because they were made in our image and dignify the individual, rich or poor, black or white, whatever their economic status, and builds a community that is so unified that it would turn heads in our broken world to say, wow, those people love each other and that they would see what it looks like, what the love of God looks like in our world. That's what this is to look like inside the church. As Jesus loved us, we love one another. Now, what does that look like outside the church? Let's go back to Peter because he gives us the answer. He says, live as free people. Absolutely. Live one You're autonomous. You are free Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Now, in America, rightly, that's a word that we don't like to use and we shouldn't. But I want you to see how this statement begins and ends. Live as free people. Live as God's slaves. Live as free people. Live as God's slaves. We're like, these do not go together, Peter. Peter said, yes, they do. Because without the freedom that comes from being God's redeemed child, an heir of eternal life, a member of the kingdom of heaven, you're a slave to death. You're a slave to sin. You are not free. But as God's slaves knowing that Jesus has the words of life, organizing your life around the, not your feelings, but the wisdom of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus, the love of Jesus, the truth of Jesus, when you organize that as the center of your life, you will find it will lead to greater and greater levels and experiences of freedom because it's the way to human flourishing. It is the way you were designed to live. And he gives four practical ways to do that. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God, honor the emperor. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God, honor the emperor. These are the four guideposts that help us navigate society. Now, if you missed the point, I made them fill in the blanks for us. How to value both autonomy and community. Respect who? Everyone. I, I, that, I'm lazy. All. Respect all. Res respect everyone. But Peter, what if I don't agree with their values? Oh, well, if you don't agree with their values, show them respect. Okay, okay, but what if they're doing something that's wrong? Okay, well, if they're doing something that's wrong, then show them respect. Okay, what, what, what if their political ideology is bad for America? Well, well, in that case, then you show them respect. Respect all. Love the believers. This is what Jesus showed us in John 17. If someone's part of the church, you love them the way Jesus loved us because this is the way of Jesus. Fear God. Peter, I love that Peter brings that back because we talked about it last week. We cannot lose the fact that Jesus is glorious. He is the Son of God. He is the King. He has the words of eternal life. Fear God and you will never fear anything again. This last one's hard, isn't it? We don't have an emperor. We have a government. 
honor the government. And, and if the candidate in a given office is doing things that are godless, you don't have to endorse the godless decisions or actions, but you honor. Honor the government. You don't have to agree with policies that you believe are bad for our community or our state or our nation or our world, but you honor. You can disagree while honoring and respecting because do you know what people who don't respect others and don't honor others are? They're marginalized. People don't care what disrespectful and dishonorable people think. But listen, if you're a Christian, do you know what you believe? If you are a Christian, you believe that you were unrespectable and dishonorable and Jesus loved you right where you were. And he gave you the honor of being God's child and an heir of eternal life. And it was his love that made you respectable and made you honorable and began to change your life. And as the church, that's what we want for people more than anything, that they meet Jesus, that their hearts and lives would change, and then our behaviors and words and actions begin to change. So what if, what if just we, starting right here at Hope Church, what if we decided, I'm going to respect everyone, even if I don't like them. What if we decided as the church that I am going to love the people of my church and all the people of Jesus' church? We might not agree on every teaching, but we agree on Jesus. What if we agreed that we are going to be people who fear God because we individually stand before him and give an account for our lives. And we honor the government, even when we don't agree, so that we can show what God's love, what Jesus' love looks like in our very broken world because we believe that Jesus is the hope of the world. We're going to pick it up there next week. Let me pray. Jesus, forgive us for thinking that your command to love doesn't apply to us. Forgive us for thinking that if someone else isn't behaving right, that nullifies your command to love. Jesus, thank you that you did not treat us that way. I ask that we will have wisdom to see life from your perspective, Jesus. So that rather than following every impulse and desire and being offended at the idea of sacrificing some of our autonomy for the sake of community and others, that, that we would look to your example. You sacrificed your entire autonomy. You sacrificed your freedom. You sacrificed your life to bring us into community. May we be small reflections of your love in this world. Life isn't about us. It's about you. You are at the center. May you always be there in our lives, Jesus. We pray this in your name. Why don't we stand as we sing one more song together this morning? When I was lost and all alone, your presence was where I found home. You were there.
witnessed it. Your strong hand have witnessed it. Your constant have witnessed it. And I'm confident I'll see it again and again. You love and I've witnessed it. You heal and I've witnessed it. You save and I witness it. And I'm confident I'll see it again and again. You're good and I've witnessed it. so good to be able to be with you all this morning. I want to invite you back next week, especially because we're going to be wrapping up the next initiative that's been happening here at Hope, which is all about the faith of the next generation and expanding the kingdom of God into a new location. And so we're going to talk all about what has happened in next, what things are wrapping up, what it is that you've done, and what is ahead on the horizon. And so you're not going to want to miss that. Come back next week. Join us online next week as we talk all about what's happening next. If you need prayer this morning, there's going to be somebody up here to the left of the stage. If you're in the room, um, you can come on up as everybody's leaving. Or if you're online, just type prayer in the chat and somebody would love to reach out and be a part of that and walk through that with you and talk with you. But with all of that in mind, we will see you here next week as we continue with First and Second Americans and talk all about what's coming next at Hope Church. We'll see you next Sunday. us here today. There are two things that we want you to know before you go. The first one is that it is not too late to connect with us, so don't forget to hit that subscribe button or fill out the connect card if you want someone on staff to connect with you later this week. That link is available in the description. Yeah, and the second thing that we want to share with you today is that this is the last Sunday that you can register for our short-term group that's going to go deeper into this series. Um, we uncovered so much today as we talked about some of the history and how we ended up here as a society. We've got a great community of people who are ready to dive deeper into these conversations with you, and we hope you'll join. If you've never been in a group before, it's a short-term group, and that's the best way to check it out for yourself. And, of course, that link is available in the description. But that is it for us, so have a great week, and we'll see you next Sunday.